Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Managing Soils to Address Global Challenges. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered, and you can ask questions throughout the event. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Mike Michener. Thank you, Michael, uh, and welcome to everyone. Uh, the Research Community of Practices annual honorary lecture features an eminent researcher, and I couldn't be more honored or more pleased to introduce this year's lecturer, Dr. Ratan Lal. Dr. Lal's work on soil management practices spans five decades and has influenced the fields of sustainable intensification and climate resilient agriculture. In 2020, Dr. Ratan Lal received the World Food Prize for his soil centric approach to increasing food production that conserves natural resources and mitigates climate change. I was very fortunate to attend the World Food Prize this past year where Dr. Law was honored in person, and I had the great pleasure of participating in an online fireside chat with him there. Dr. Law has published over 1,000 peer-reviewed articles and has mentored about 400 professionals from around the world, making up a network of scientists addressing global issues related to food and nutritional security, adaptation and mitigation of climate change, and restoration of degraded soils and ecosystems. Dr. Law's work underpins our accomplishments under Feed the Future and will serve as a key resource as we develop the new 2022 Global Food Security Research Strategy. We are also looking forward to working with Dr. Law as a new member of the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development. With the events unfolding in Ukraine, this is a somber and solemn morning but we can always take a moment to reflect on ways we can all contribute to making the world a better place. I can't think of a more appropriate way to hope for a better future than by spending some time with a visionary like Dr. Law. Dr. Law, we look forward to your remarks. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mishnah. I appreciate the opportunity. I also want to thank, uh, in addition to your kind word of introduction, Dr. Rob Bertram, Dr. Jerry Glover, Gross, uh, Clara Cohen, many other colleagues. It's a great honor and privilege. I hope you can see my screen, slides, and uh, you can also hear me well. The topic I want to discuss with you today is soil science and global challenges. I want to begin with the uh, population human population. At present, in 2022, it's estimated at 7.9 billion. By 2050, 9.8 billion. And by 2100, more than 11 billion. In addition to human, we also have domesticated livestock. Cows estimated at 1.4 billion, pigs 1 billion, sheep and goat almost 2 billion, chicken 20 billion. These human and animals require resources. It is estimated that humans are already using equivalent to one half of the planet in terms of the resources appropriated by humanity. For example, the water footprint, green water, 6,700 kilometer cube. Blue water, 1,000 to 1,700 kilometer cube per year. Gray water, 1,400 kilometer cube per year. In terms of the sustainability, the carbon used by human, 46 to 55 gigaton of CO2 per year. The sustainable value should be 18 to 25 gigaton of carbon per year. Ecological footprint, 18.2 billion hectare equivalent. It should not be more than 12 billion hectare. 
material supplies 70 gigaton per year it should be somewhere about 10.5 ton per capita which means about 8 gigaton or 8.5 or so ton per capita rather than 10.5 per capita human footprint blue water has increased for the last century from 1900 to 2000 by a factor of almost six reactive nitrogen that the fertilizer nitrogen by a factor of nine and carbon emission over the last century by a factor of 16. is there for time to think and revisit our strategy how to be environment friendly how to make agriculture and a lifestyle environmental congenial protective restorative and friendly of course now let's talk about the carbon emission historic carbon emission in land use change from 1750 to 2020 is about 235 gigaton over the same period the fossil fuel emission are 460 gigaton from 1750 industrial revolution to 2020 total emission from land use and fossil fuel to date 690 out of which one third is absorbed by land half of it by the atmosphere and the remaining by the ocean so land has been a sink even under natural condition as human intervention has not particularly tried to recognize the importance of the land-based sink. Another source of emission, which is not commonly mentioned, is the humanities food waste. Per capita kilogram of carbon dioxide emitted per person per year by food waste alone, North America, 860 kilograms industrialized asia 800 kilogram europe about 700 latin america 500 north africa about 350 south and southeast asia about 350. each one of us is culprit and victim in more than one scenarios i think we need to think what can be done to the atmospheric carbon stock which is influencing the climate change. Let's take a look at the total carbon stock in the atmosphere. I'm not talking about the CO2 in parts per million. I'm talking about the total carbon stock in gigaton, petagram is gigaton, billion tons. Pre-agriculture, 10,000 years ago, it was 360 gigaton. Pre-industrial era, it was 560 gigaton by 1750. So by the time agriculture began 8,000 BC and by the time industrial revolution started in 1750, we had already added 200 gigaton that primarily mostly came from land use conversion for agriculture. Since 1750 till now, the carbon stock in the atmosphere is 880 gigaton. That 320 since 1750 has come both from fossil fuel and land use conversion. Total emission from land use conversion, if you take 320 gigaton until 1750 and 255, which I showed you since 1750, is about 575 gigaton. Total emission from fossil fuel is 445 gigaton. Therefore, with some change in land use pattern, some restoration of degraded land, better use of land, bridging the yield gap, returning some land back to nature, we can, should, must put some of that 575 gigaton back into the nature, into the land, soil, and vegetation. Soil degradation, I already mentioned, one third of the total land area is degraded. 47% of forest land, crop land about 18%, total land area about 2 billion hectare. Compared to other peak natural resources like mineral, coal, oil, etc., 
we are indeed currently facing the issue of peak soil. And if you follow the same Hubert curve, the per capita optimal land area per person for good living is about a quarter of a hectare. In many densely populated countries, the per capita land area is already 0 0.05 hectare. China is very close to it. Bangladesh is close to it. And this has promoted this serious problem, land grab. You understand what that means? And soil refugees, climate refugees. So indeed, there's a peak soil, there's an endangered soil. We do have extinct soil. It's not only plants and animals that are endangered and peak and extinct. We also have the soil the same way. So if you look at the natural resources used for agriculture, 40% of our terrestrial surface is used for raising plants and animals. 75% of agricultural land estimated about 3.75 billion hectare is allocated to raising animals. Another 1.5 billion hectare to raising crops, total 5 billion hectare. 70% of global fresh water withdrawal are used for irrigation. 30 to 35% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the world food systems. All aspects of agriculture plus food processing, packaging, transport, management, everything food supply chain. 30 to 35%. And yet, 820 million people, one in 10, are food insecure, and one in four are malnourished. Therefore, business as usual is obviously not an option, it's not sustainable. The food security issue really has to be looked at from the point of view of global sustainable development goals. We made good progress. In 1990s, almost a billion people, more than a billion were insecure food, we kept on decreasing the number to less than 700 million, 690 to be exact, in December 2019. In December 2020, primarily because of the COVID, the number of insecure people is 820 million. Of this, South Asia has almost 37%, Sub-Saharan Africa 34%, South Eastern Asia at 9 to 10%, Latin America 6%, and others 13%. South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa account for most of the world's hungry people. This part, just as Millennium Development Goal, unfortunately, Sustainable Development Goal as of today are not on track and we still have eight years, we can do something even now. Therefore, after what I presented to you, what the state of the planet Earth is, we have at least 10 issues of global significance. Population, 7.9 billion, increasing at the rate of 1.1% per year. That is 7.25 million per month per capita arable land area, already 0.22 hectare, and decreasing to 0 0.07 hectare in 30 countries by 2025. Soil degradation, 2 billion hectare, and increasing somewhere between 5 to 10 million hectare per year. Renewable freshwater supply, less than 1,000 cubic meter per people in 30 countries, and those countries number with water scarcity increasing to 58, 4 billion people affected by 2050. Atmospheric concentration as of yesterday, 222 plus 412.5 parts per million and increasing at the rate of more than two parts per million per year. Energy use currently 575 quads that is 10 to the 15 BTU, and increasing 2.2% per year. The number will be 736 quads by 2040. Per capita grain consumption, 
300 kilogram, unfortunately in some countries decreasing, and food insecure population 820 million and increasing, especially the CO2 emission per person globally, 4.5 metric ton of CO2, US somewhere between 15 and 17. Humanities per capita water footprint, 1385 cubic meter per year per person and increasing. This state of affair cannot continue. It must not continue for the sake of humanity and of course for the sake of the planet Earth. UN Sustainable Development Goals are now being challenged. Solution to this issue really lies in sustainable management of natural resources, especially the soil, soil of the world. That brings me to the question of the food system. The food system summit started uh, for two years, ended on 23rd of September, the final report by the Secretary General, and this has failed to end hunger and nutrition. The food system at present have failed to end hunger and malnutrition. They have not provided adequate nutritious food, healthy diet and safe food and they have degraded soils, polluted water, aggravated global warming, dwindled biodiversity and denuded landscape. 30% of all greenhouse gases come from food systems. The way food is produced and consumed, it affects the health of soil, plants, animal, people, ecosystem, and the planet itself. Above all, the sustainable development goal of the Agenda 2030 are not on the track, and food systems have something to do about it. Therefore, we should be thinking about nature positive production, nature friendly production. Agriculture and nature have to be having following synergistic pathway, friendly pathway, cooperative pathway. Agriculture, which we, each one of us perform three times a day when we eat food, has to be nature positive, has to be nature friendly. There's no other option. It must mitigate climate change. It must reduce emissions and increase carbon capture. It must regenerate and protect critical ecosystem. It must reduce food waste and energy uses, and we must return half of the agricultural land back to nature sometime by the end of this century or soon thereafter. We cannot keep taking more and more from nature. Managing soil health is very critical to regenerative agriculture, digital agriculture, artificial intelligence in agriculture, biofortification of crop to fight hidden hunger, the soil, water, air, energy, nexus, interconnectivity. These are not silos, they interact together. And of course, we must try to build and synthesize and restore the soil quality and soil health. We must think about soil less farming in an urban ecosystem so that we can return some land back to nature, but more importantly, take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which have taken a lot for the last 10,000 years, back into the land. That brings me to the question of the interconnectivity, one health concept. Health of soil, plants, animal, human, ecosystem, and the planet is one and indivisible. This was said in a very different way by John Muir, but the concept is the same. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitch to everything else in the universe. And this interconnectivity should not be forgotten. I know because of the COVID-19, we have given a lot more emphasis to human and animal health, which is true, should not be undermined, but the fact remains human health is strongly impacted by the health of soil. True soil impact on plant, animal, environment, and the planet. That is the philosophy 
that's the concept that we should not forget. Now coming back to soil quality. If you look at a soil profile, you normally see the top soil rich in underneath in many soils, especially the dry region, we have inorganic carbon. And we have both of these carbon which are important. Question is how do you increase the depleted carbon stock in the soil? Soils of agroecosystems, especially those of resource poor small farmers, is depleted to as much as 75 to 80 percent of what it originally was. And the only way we can restore is by adding organic matter, biomass carbon, into that soil. So here is a biomass carbon. Somehow it's got to become a humus. This biochemical transformation requires input additional plant nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, at least these. Why? Because the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the residue, in the wheat straw, corn straw, is about 100, 120. In the humus, it's about 10 to 15. Carbon to phosphorus ratio in the straw is about 200. In the humus, it's about 50. Carbon to sulfur ratio in the straw is 500. In the humus, it's about 70. So humus is enriched of nutrients. Therefore, for the organic carbon to be replaced in the soil that we have depleted, not only have the farmer to put the residue back, but this residue also has to be supplemented by additional nutrients. Therefore, farmer has to be compensated for all those additional input. This is very critical. And that brings us to how how this transformation will happen. The current business as usual, as we have discussed, it is characterized by 5D. Humanities have depleted, degraded, destroyed, discarded, and dominated nature. In addition, we should think about how to reduce our needs so that we can share some of those resources with another habitat of the planet, the biodiversity. And therefore, that transformation is with five R. And what are the R's? Reduce, reuse, recycle, regenerate, and restore. So that some of the land can be returned back to nature. That's the philosophy. That's the concept that we want to talk about. And these days, including the Food System Summit, talk about regenerative agriculture. We have 300,000 types of known soil series. To assume that there is a one type of regenerative agriculture applicable universally is rather being naive. But there is a one concept, the principle. The principle is the one which is inspired by eco-innovation. It's powered by known carbon energy, known carbon energy. It's driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure but it must be supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere at the bedrock of sustainable development. So any practice that will recarbonize the terrestrial biosphere based on intensive ecological intensification, based on non-carbon energy and driven by a circular economy, it does not mean no input. I want to come back to that in a moment. No input is not what we are talking about. And this concept is based on continuous soil cover, so are never left bare, no soil disturbance, integrated nutrient and pest management. Remember, integrated. It does not say zero, this. Integrated. Complex rotation and cover crop so that we can produce more from less. More from less. Less means judicious use reduce waste. Many people talk about zero budget natural farming. And I want to make sure that's a different than the regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture not to be confused with zero budget natural farming. The latter sometime is not an option to feed 8 billion or 11 billion people by 2100. Regenerative agriculture is based on the law of return. Law of return very well explained by Sir Robert Howard, 
that anything taken from soil must be returned to it. And that is what it is. The law state that substances we take from nature must be returned to the place taken from the same place one way or the other. And that is what it means. If you want to harvest productivity, grains, livestock, anything produced, whatever is taken one way or the other has to be returned back to because we have taken too much already. Therefore, what we put back into the soil has to be more than what we take out of soil. And there are many ways we can put things back in the soil. But the taken away carbon from soil by erosion, leaching, decomposition, those are the most common processes. Harvesting sometimes, root crops can also take away soil and carbon. But whatever we put in the soil must always exceed what we are taking out. Unfortunately, throughout the developing world and everywhere else, most of the time, what we put in is much less than what we take out. Therefore, soils are continuously being depleted. And that depletion process is what we call degradation. It has to stop by innovative agricultural practices, such as conservation agriculture, some people call regenerative agriculture, agroecology, agroforestry, integration of crops with trees and livestock, practices with positive soil ecosystem carbon budget. The concept is CNPK. C before NPK, carbon organic matter before NPK, so that the need for NPK progressively becomes less. And the CNPK concept is integrated soil fertility management. Balanced use of N with P, K, S, and other micronutrients. Drip fertigation to replace flood irrigation and digital agriculture, precision farming, artificial intelligence, many other options. If we did that and consider about the positive carbon budget, the technical potential of carbon sequestration soil of the world is about two to two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. Remember, annually we are adding carbon into the atmosphere, 10 gigaton through fossil fuel, and about one gigaton through land use. Out of 11, two and a half can be returned back to soil by improved soil management practices. Between 2020 and 2100, the estimate of how much carbon we can put back in the soil is about 180 gigaton. In vegetation, we can put another 150, 160 gigaton, total about 333 gigaton, which can create a drawdown of atmospheric CO2 about 157 parts per million. Therefore, if we find non-carbon fuel sources soon, solar energy, hydro, geo, whatever, bio, and we do better agriculture, which we just explained, the possibility of limiting global warming to two degrees centigrade is still possible as long as we take action. And for this action, one part is paying farmer fairly, justly, transparently, and sincerely. That payment, under $30 per ton of carbon, come to $30 to $35 per credit of carbon. So if a farmer sequesters half a ton, they should be paid about $60 to $70 per hectare, $25 to $30 per acre. If they sequester one third of a ton, they should get about $40, $40 per hectare, about $18 to $20 per acre. $5 per person per acre or per ton credit will not do it. Underpayment of very precious resource undervaluing a precious resource, you know, leads to the tragedy of the common. You don't want to create tragedy worse than what we have. We should pay them properly, honestly, fairly, transparently, judiciously, make sure they get what they deserve. We can think about small farmers. Total crop production small farmers, about 570 million of them globally, is about one third, 30%. Food supply about 30 to 34%. Thirty 
gross agricultural area cultivated by them, 24%. Total number, about 570 to 600 million. Their farm size is less than two hectares. We cannot ignore them. We cannot afford to ignore them because 2.3 to 3.5 billion people are fed by small landholder agriculture. They're very important. Sub Saharan Africa, smallholder farmers will need to produce three times more cereals by 2050 relative to 2005 7 to maintain the present level of self sufficiency, which is only 80%. Therefore, small farmers there really need major transformation in agriculture, especially because soil degradation in Africa, Sub Saharan Africa, 65% of cropland. And serious land degradation accounts for very major problem affecting 180 million people, 200 million recently estimate, which are food insecure. And increased risks of soil erosion between now and end of the century in sub-Saharan Africa, maybe additional 30 to 40%, which is really a cause of food insecurity. I personally believe that the Green Revolution bypassed Sub-Saharan Africa because the soil resources were neglected, are still being neglected. Nutrient management, global fertilizer use 135 kilograms per hectare, global average. Sub-Saharan Africa, 17 kilograms per hectare. Yesterday, I checked the number. It's about 18 to 19 kilograms. 20% of the cropland area uses only 2% of the world fertilizer. Irrigation, which can alleviate drought, only 7% of cropland and area in Africa, about 13 to 15 million hectares is presently irrigated, compared with 40% in Asia and 15, 14%. So drip sub fertigation that saves water should be a very good option. Because of the degradation, look at the trend in rice production in Africa and the world. And still big yield gap. Maize production the same way, big yield gap. And this yield gap is soil quality not being managed properly, soil health not being restored properly. It cannot happen otherwise. So let's take in the case of a roadmap what should happen in sub-Saharan Africa between now and 2030, for example, on a short period of time, fertilizer use from 13, 15, 17 kilograms go up to 60 kilograms. Irrigated land area from 7% to 20%. Conservation agriculture on about 1 million hectare now get up to 50 million hectare. Agroforestry, maybe 10% now of total area. We must have some guidelines, some agenda, some program, and we must stick to it so that we can achieve. So 2030 Sustainable Development Goal, Africa has a roadmap that we must try to achieve. It's a challenge, but I think trying to develop some benchmark studies uh, where you on a community base implement what we were talking about, uh, it is possible. It's doable. It's something within the next eight years we must try. So the goals for the 21st century globally, return land to nature. How much? 10% per decade out of 5 billion hectare. Every decade, 10% return back to nature. Stick to that agenda. Restore degraded land. We got 2 billion hectare to get land degradation neutrality. If you are getting a new degradation, 10 billion, restore at least 10 billion, preferably more. And other part, protect all existing natural ecosystem. Do not convert them for human use. Protect natural system. We must reconcile the need to grow healthy food with the necessity of improving the environment. Environment cannot be ignored. And we must leave no farmer left behind, no farmer left behind, especially the small farmer, 570 million hectares of them. They cannot be ignored. No farmer can be ignored, no farmer, but especially small farmer. In this regard, the private sector may have a very important role to play. Private sector can play 
tremendous thing in translating science into action, in promoting nature positive agriculture, in increasing access to input, and in improving investment in agriculture, research and development. I can never ever overemphasize the role of private sector. The combination of private sector with policymakers, with academicians, with international organization, with land manager, that's farmer, sustainable development goals such as number one, number two, number six, number 13, number 15, can only be met through this kind of very positive synergism. I want to mention a license program, Living Soils of the Americas, ECA and Ohio State are implementing together. The idea here is that the soil is a living entity and that life-giving processes of the soil must be enhanced, must be restored, must be judiciously managed. And while doing that, we can also, of course, sequester carbon in soil. Hopefully this program can also be implemented not only just out all through America, all 34 countries, but also in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. The long-term objective are also being considered very actively as we speak by a program called CASH, that is Coalition for Soil Health Management that emerged from the Food Systems Summit. And this CASH uh, has already got support from 110 member nations to do what? to enhance cooperation among multiple stakeholders, to promote on the ground adoption of best management practices, to develop tools for measurement, monitoring, verification of soil health and its indicators globally, to advocate a system-based soil health agenda, to implement an action plan for restoring soil health at local level, at national level, develop a protocol for payment to farmers, as we had discussed today, for ecosystem services, empower farmers and land managers, especially the women farmer, small landholder, for best management practices, strengthen human resource capital, enhance respectability of the soil health and the farming profession. I want to mention the word respectability and alleviate drudgery of the farming operations. The hoe, the hoe-based agriculture, the manual, the hardship, somewhere we need to improve all those parts. And that brings me to the last topic, education of the next generation. In addition to three R's, goal of the education is to be prepare the next generation to address global issues, which we discussed, 10 of them, food and nutrition, environment, soil, water, air, global warming, personal responsibility, culprit and victim, as we talked about it, ethics, integrity, and professionalism in respect for nature. Respect for nature. Do not take nature for granted. In this regard, connecting children with nature, right from the beginning, from the kindergarten stage, is very critical. I would like to see children letter books, alphabet book, written in a way that emphasizes nature, that emphasizes agriculture, that emphasizes soil, so that children know where the food comes from and what a healthy soil look like. And this is something which is a, a mantra that should be teaching to our children from the very beginning, and that is the healthy soil equal to healthy diet, equal to healthy people, equal to healthy ecosystem, equal to healthy planetary processes. Mike and Rob, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Ratan. Uh, what a tour de force you've given us. I know all of us at USAID have been very excited uh, looking forward to your talk today. And I think everybody, uh, almost 300 people have been watching this and many more will see the recording. And I believe that they, uh, I, I, we know why people came because you have done such a fantastic job at integrating these global challenges and, and, and showing us so many things. And your, your talk has stimulated many questions, Ratan. So I'm going to try 
my best to uh, do them uh, justice. Um, let's start with one from Alvin Hoopscher, the D Director General of the International Fertilizer Development Center. Uh, Dr. Lal, you indicate that agriculture produces 30 to 35 percent of greenhouse gas emission. Other sources suggest 18 to 20 percent. What is the difference? I think I know, but I'm going to ask you, Raton. You're the expert. Alvin, you caught my mistake. It should be food system that produces 30 percent. Agriculture producing food itself is 14 to 18 percent. Correct. When you combine food production with the entire food supply chain, then it becomes 30 percent. Yeah, I think that. Raton, is Raton, if I might, where does land use conversion uh, fit into that? It's also very substantial. Very substantial. Globally, raw land use conversion is one gigaton. Uh, per year, even last year it was 0.9 gigaton. So if we can stop uh, converting natural ecosystem to agriculture, we can also decrease uh, uh, emission from the land-based system. Uh, my personal opinion is that this estimate uh, of agriculture is less than what it can be. For example, soil erosion is a major source of emission of gases. And uh, 24 gigaton of soil is transported by hydric erosion. And the estimate of emission from disturbance of the carbon cycle from erosion does not appear in some of those uh, one gigaton land use conversion part. So these things are a uh, little bit of guesstimate need to be improved. But Alvin, you are right. It is total food supply chain foods system that is uh, 30 percent. And uh, if I might, given Dr. Hoopscher's uh, location at the Fertilizer Center, I thought it was fascinating, Raton, how you connected carbon sequestration to soil fertility and to the addition of nutrients. This is something that isn't necessarily intuitive for many of us. So this is, a, I mean, perhaps we'll talk more about that. Another, an next question I'd like to pose to you is from Sabrina Berner. Can you address, one, the timing required for carbon sequestration in the soil, and two, effective, credible, and affordable systems to measure soil carbon sequestration? So two different questions, but very related, I think. Very, very good question. I'm gonna go back to the previous question. It is very correct that improving soil health will increase the use efficiency of fertilizer therefore decrease the rate of fertilizer which is applied. I was very surprised the other day reading a paper, fertilizer used in Punjab, East Punjab, uh, is 240 kilogram per hectare. Global average is 135. At China, somewhere even 400 kilogram per hectare. We cannot continue keep increasing the rate. Somewhere we have to restore soil health, decrease the rate, improve efficiency. Now carbon sequestration, yes. The rate of carbon sequestration under ideal condition in cropland is really, for organic carbon, pretty about one ton of carbon per hectare. In the midwest, for example. Uh, some people have monitored one and a half ton, but I think one ton average. And if you're in an arid climate, maybe the rate is less. In addition to organic carbon, probably uh, inorganic carbon, secondary carbonates, and bicarbon is another part but the rate of carbon sequestration in organic is pretty slightly less, and the impact on crop growth of that are not studied. So it's a slow process. While I remember working in Africa and Nigeria, I lost 50% uh, of carbon in almost five to 10 years after deforestation. In temperate climate, maybe 50 years, where you lose 50%, uh, but the gain is very slow. It's a slow process. So a new equilibrium of a soil carbon after adopting, say, conservation agriculture would be 25 years, a generation. So it's a slow process. Measurement monitoring is a very good question. Uh, yes, the time uh, involved in sampling soil, in preparing sample, grinding, bringing to the lab and analyzing is not only time consuming, but also expensive. 
but I'm very pleased to report that uh, devices are being developed which can be used in field. I have one uh, which uh, cost about $400. It has been used in Malawi and elsewhere by several colleagues. New devices are coming up as we speak. We have a project funded by Microsoft. They have a handheld Wi-Fi to monitor organic matter content. We are working with them now to improve it, to convert also not only moisture, but uh, soil organic carbon. A lot of progress is going to happen within the next two to five years. And uh, this is a very important part. I've been mentioning to my colleague, the biggest breakthrough will happen when a farmer has a Wi-Fi and they can monitor soil health parameters such as carbon and water uh, by themselves in the field at a very low, low cost. We are on the path toward that direction. It will happen soon. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lal. Uh, one follow-on from Dr. Berner again. Uh, she talks about acidification of soils uh, with fertilizer use in Af West Africa, and she's asking about uh, the use of lime, which we know figured very prominently in Brazil, for example. Yes, acidification, especially with nitrogenous fertilizer, is a serious problem. Uh, I was working in, on alfi soils in Ibadan, Nigeria, and uh, we were using only uh, 60 kilograms of nitrogen in those soil with low activity clay, low K energy and capacity. So over 17 year period, our experiment showed that even at that small rate, the pH went from seven to 5.5, uh, some cases five. So acidification has to be addressed. If you maintain the organic matter content, of course that will, uh, create more buffering capacity, it will increase cation exchange capacity, uh, it will uh, resist the rapid decline. Liming definitely is a very important part. So it is not only C and PK, it's C and PKs and CA. Uh, calcium. And okay. calcium, magnesium, that's the lime. So we really got to, and that's what integrated soil fertility management is. Right. Thank you. I want to speak to the audience here for a second and just tell you we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of questions. I'm trying to pick out a few uh, technical questions to begin with, and then we'll move on to some that are at a higher level uh, and, and, and then some uh, challenging questions as well, some scenario questions. So I hope everybody will be able to stay with us. We have a good period available uh, for discussion this morning. So uh, after Turning uh, to a next question, uh, let's look at um, uh, we have a question about peak phosphorus. Uh, can you speak to that one? Yes, um, this was a topic. Terry Fowler, Dr. Terry Fowler. This was a topic about ten years ago that we were running out of phosphorus. I think since then. Uh, recent data have come out uh, from several sources, uh, both in Europe and US and elsewhere, that there are a lot more uh, fossil reserves available, proven than what we thought 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but having said that, uh, making sure that phosphorus is recycled is very important. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, mega cities. Uh, where a city of 10 million people requires 6,000 tons of food, which of course the nutrients like phosphorus coming into the city. So recycling those nutrients to produce 15, 10, 20% of green food within the city limits by recycling is something has to be given more and more importance. Uh, even recycling of animal waste and crop residue. So the nutrients like phosphorus are recycled. So although the peak uh, danger, even if we say we have a, a phosphorus enough rather than for 50 years, for 500 years, in a planetary and human scale, even 500 years uh, is a little bit of frightening. So recycling the limited finite resources, using them properly, avoiding overuse is very critical. You remember 5R I had, and P is a very good candidate for that. Thank you, uh, Ratan. Uh, uh, Catherine Reby uh, writes, uh, do, not, do not many chemical fertilizers 
also contribute to soil degradation in the long term? What kind of increased fertilizer use is being promoted? And if I might, Rattan, it seems to me like you're laying out a scenario where in some parts of the world, we should be using less, far yes. less. And in yes. some parts of the world, we should be using more. Uh, yes. But let me uh, turn that question back to you now. Absolutely, uh, Rob. As I mentioned, uh, uh, China, and uh, I was surprised about India and Punjab, uh, 240 kilogram, and China, 300, 400 kilogram. Uh, that's overuse. That's excessive use. That's uh, harmful use. It's something uh, not a, a good thing to do. So use efficiency should be improved. And, but on the other hand, Africa, which has Sub-Saharan Africa, has a 30 to 40 kilogram per hectare of negative nutrient budget per year, 30 to 40 kilogram. And remember the law of return. The law of return says anything that you take out from soil, nature, you must put it back to the same place, one way or the other. So I do not want to go into the question of how the depleted nutrients are returned, but it's very important that they are returned. Soil, my friend, is like a bank account. You can never ever take more out of a bank than what you deposited in it. Soil, the same way, you cannot take out more nutrients out of it than what you replace on a continuous basis without degrading soil health. So fertilizer, yes, they have their own uh, issues that need to be addressed, but it is one thing that can immediately and quickly provide the nutrients, but on a long-term basis, I think if we manage soil health, soil organic matter content, which should be about three, four, five percent in the root zone, the need for high rate uh, can certainly be eliminated. I do want to mention, Rob, one thing. Uh, many people think that uh, perhaps we can do feed 11 billion people without putting chemical. Uh, the amount of food we require and the quality of food we require must consider balanced application of nutrients in soil. They have to come from somewhere. And if that somewhere recycling biological fixation is not enough, then the judicious use of fertilizer is very critical. Remember, the difference between poison and remedy is a dose and time. So the dose of application of fertilizer and the time is very critical. Thank you. One thing I wanted to underscore that you said a few minutes ago, but I think bears repeating, is that when we have more carbon in the soil, our fertilizer use is more efficient. In other words, we can use less fertilizer just by virtue of the fact of the soil being healthier. And, and so this is, a, this is a synergistic process. <clears throat> so let's turn to this issue of carbon in soils. And we'll start with a question from Dr. Claudia Ringler at uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute. She asks, in terms of how to compensate farmers for improving soil health, there is a concept of, quote, charismatic carbon. In other words, acknowledgement of co-benefits restoring soil carbon for humanity. So this is getting at this, this challenge that would be inherent in what you've laid out. Thank you. I think I fully agree with what Claudia says. If we can improve the carbon stock in soil, uh, both the quality and the quantity, several inputs will be decreased automatically. Irrigation water requirement. In fact, there is a data. If uh, you increase uh, organic carbon by one ton, how much water irrigation do you say? Because of the increase in water holding capacity of the soil. There's a data on how much nitrogen you can save by increasing the organic carbon content input. Uh, phosphorus, the same thing. The tillage, the soil structure is improved when the soil organic matter is good. So energy saving is also there. So there are co-benefits of improving soil health. The part that we have to think is that uh, soil health has been degraded by long-term land misuse and soil mismanagement. It cannot be immediately reversed overnight. The restoration is going to take time. And over that time period, when soil health is being restored by changing to restorative, regenerative agricultural practices, farmers should be compensated so they do not have to suffer any 
financial losses. And that is where the pay and ecosystem services come in. So, uh, Katie West asked, perhaps you mentioned this, but you mentioned paying smallholder farmers for the carbon they return to the soil. Who are you proposing pays them? Uh, first of all, the, what is to be paid? And I did uh, say that very categorically, do not undervalue this such a precious carbon resource. So paying farmer at the price of 30 to $35 per credit, and credit is uh, one metric ton of CO2, is probably fair. That's similar to what the European uh, Union is doing, about 25 euro. So I think that's fair. Who pays? You and I pay. <laughs> the public pays. Uh, the uh, consumer pays. That's always the case. So eventually, I suppose, the farm commodity price may have to go up. But in the meantime, uh, industry certainly, I mentioned the role of private sector. Uh, some private sector, I do not need to mention, are already beginning to pay. Uh, but I think the payment has to be more than what is being paid. Uh, but eventually, the responsibility of payment to farmer is uh, with the public, with us, with consumer, because we are the culprit and we are the victim. Therefore, we must take care of what we have done wrong to the planet. Okay, uh, thank you, Ratan. Now, on this same idea, uh, uh, Luke Colavito from IDE says, Dr. Lal, the monitoring best soil practice is challenging. You mentioned some technologies to measure soil health. Do you see best practices in soil monitoring emerging? Do you see systems of certification, like now done for organic, organic agriculture as a potential for regenerative agriculture? Yes, I think you are very right. It's not only monitoring the soil health, that's a impact of the regenerative agricultural practices, but to monitor uh, what is being done. I think remote sensing uh, is really a very good option. Satellite, uh, the uh, aerial photographs. Uh, let me give you an example. CRP was practiced, uh, I stopped, in 1987 farm bill uh, in the US and eventually CR, the conservation reserve program set aside in European language. Uh, 40 million acres, 16 million hectare. We did not actually go to each and every farm and had a flume uh, to monitor runoff and erosion. Uh, we from the satellite imagery, from the aerial photograph, saw that the farmers were not cultivating that land. It was uh, set aside. It was, and therefore, we were paying them uh, according to uh, the data that was generated that way. I think it's the same thing going to happen in adoption of conservation agriculture. Uh, I call that as the best agriculture regenerative practice. So, yes, we can evaluate uh, conservation agriculture remote sensely and, of course, ground to thing occasionally. But sometime uh, we have to uh, believe that the modern technology can really provide answer to the land use. Current land area under conservation agriculture, somewhere less than 200 million hectare of cropland, maybe close to 180, most of it in, in the Americas, both north and south, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, uh, US, Canada are doing quite well. Not so in Africa, not so much in Asia. I think we need to promote that practice again rewarding farmer and giving them the due that uh, they really deserve for the ecosystem services they create. Great. Ratan, um, we have, I want to just flag something that uh, Casey Arun has commented on. He says the aggregate impacts of soil carbon sequestration should be interpreted carefully, which in the long run can be lost quickly and go back to the atmosphere. How can we deal with this? And then I'm also going to share a, um, a question is from Kashlendra Tingi, who says, is there a method to provide carbon credits, <clears throat> excuse me, for agricultural products which have more than two years of utilization life cycle? So his examples are cotton and other fiber crops. In other words, trying to, uh, I guess, see the life of the product as also a source of carbon 
uh, 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 being uh, sequestered. Thank you. Yes, uh, permanence part, Rob, is uh, it comes very often. Uh, the carbon that you sequester in soil, will it stay there? And of course, it's not a sequestration if it doesn't stay there. So please remember, when I talk about carbon sequestration, I mean it's going to stay there for decades, if not for centuries and millennia. And of course, if carbon is protected properly in soil, uh, we know that it can stay there for millennia. And what is proper protection? A, it's deeper in the subsoil. B, it is a formation of interaction with clay or suscue oxide, formation of so-called organomineral complexes, formation of stable aggregates. And to achieve all this, uh, eliminating tillage, mechanical tillage, is the critical part. So if you follow carbon sequestration practices that you are talking about, some people think conservation has three pillars. I think it has five pillars. No plowing, returning crop residue, growing cover crop, integrated soil fertility management, and complex crop rotation. If you follow those five basic principles, where will the carbon go? It will stay in the ground. The question is making sure that those five components are followed. We should be able to check that by remote sensing, by satellite imagery by aerial photograph, by ground truthing occasionally, and pay farmers for doing exactly that. It will stay there. Yes, byproduct uh, of the commodity, uh, if they are used properly, uh, also sequester carbon, you are absolutely right. Uh, a typical example is uh, wood, forest. When forest wood is used for long-term development of even the homes, furniture, other thing. Uh, it's life and is, is a, for a long period of time. So payment for carbon credit should be based on how long is the carbon staying in the land-based sink for which farmers are paid. So development of a proper protocol uh, is certainly required. It's being talked about, being discussed, but developing a, a indicator, key criteria not only that the carbon is put in the land, but it stays there over a longer period of time, farmers should be rewarded accordingly. So um, thank you, Ratan. Peter Sutton asks something about uh, land restoration and rewilding. That's a good term. You recommend we return land to nature at a huge scale. Where will this land come from and who will pay for it? Another question of how, the, how this will be financed. Uh, and should I, we allocate 10% of each farm or take out huge areas? And I think that's an important question too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a very, very important philosophy. I'm concerned when I hear that we need 250 million more hectare by 2050 or 500 million more hectare. By, uh, absolutely not. I think we have too much land already. So what in Europe language called land sparing and rewilding is what I call land return is exactly the same concept. Human are already using 40 more percent, 40 percent of the land area. We don't need it. Uh, I have taken a bold step in saying, why can't we return half of the land out of five billion, two and a half billion go back to nature, let's say by 2100. And uh, where will it come from? Well, it comes from uh, uh, A, uh, producing judiciously, making sure that the yield gap, such as in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, probably tremendous uh, yield gap, the yield of cereals at one and a half ton per hectare on a continental level, even the 70 my yield experiment was five ton per hectare. Uh, why can't it be tripled or even quadrupled? Same thing in South Asia, India, uh, the cropland yield are not all that, of, especially of the rain-fed agriculture, all that great. Uh, in Indian uh, condition, uh, Africa quadrupled, India at least doubled. So bridging the yield gap is one where the land will come from. The second part where the land will come from is food wastage. 
I mentioned uh, emission from food. One and a half gigaton, I was reading some article uh, yesterday, of food produced is wasted globally. 30 to 40 percent, even in the United States. Uh, tremendous amount of food waste. Food waste is a crime against nature and humanity. Uh, the total amount of people being underfed, 820 million, of, and being wasted uh, a billion or a billion and a half. So food waste has stopped. I think 5% maybe it's acceptable, but 30%, 40%, absolutely not. So that's where the land will come. Total food wastage is equal to the entire area of South Asia, Indian subcontinent. Can you imagine? So we got to think, our, that is where I think the children are being educated, the ethics, the morality, the value, the natural resources, where the food come from and shouldn't be taken from, is very critical. So, and then uh, we should reward farmer for using the land properly. So the slogan is use the best and save the rest on nature. No way to bring more land back for agriculture return land we must have an agenda 10 percent i think is too small those small farmers who have only two hectares uh, what i'm going to ask them to return but a community as a whole i have seen in mato grosso uh, some kind of rule that uh, every farm must have a 30 percent forest i think something like that on a region by region basis that every farm should have some spare that's the only option and I, I want to challenge you a bit on that, Rattan, because um, I mean, I think you could, like you say, region by region, the context specific. But let's take a, a, a part of the argument is that we have extended agriculture into fragile context, the fragile soils, hillsides, wetlands that otherwise could be providing all kinds of environmental services. And I'm guessing that for some kinds of environmental services, not necessarily say pollination, but say, for example, watersheds and such, you need contiguous areas that are going back to nature. So, so and, and we're gonna to get to questions about policy shortly too, but can you say a bit more about this question about where that land should come from? Because I think, it, like you say, it would really vary, yes? Rob, you are absolutely right. There's no contradiction about that. Uh, agricultural is suited for agriculture. So the so-called fragile ecosystem are uh, ecologically sensitive land rate, uh, Amazon, drier cart, steep slope, they really should not be under agriculture. You are very correct. So those priorities, uh, where are the agricultural land which are steep slope, like what we did uh, in the CRP program. The highly erodible land, more than certain slope percent, was taken out wherever it was. I think the same thing applies globally. The basic concept is that the land which is uh, not suitable for agriculture is the first land to go back to retirement. That is where restoration of carbon, water resources, biodiversity, and you are also right, the continuity of uh, wild land from the biodiversity point of view is very critical. It is a complex issue. I think we should all agree that yes, returning land back to nature is a high priority. But then how we implement, I think all these factors we discussed have to come into uh, play and come up with a policy. Great, thank you. I want to have a scenario question here for you, a fascinating one from Kerry Fowler. A what if question. What if there had been a CGIAR center focused not so much on specific crops, but on soil? In the absence of this, do we have structures or mechanisms for coordinating, prioritizing, and promoting implementation of soil science research? What might you suggest? This is a question that uh, really is um, very close to my heart. Uh, oh, yes. IITA in 69, and we thought IITA was going to be a soil and natural resource center. Uh, the first, some of the first scientists hired uh, uh, were uh, soil scientists, uh, Frank Moorman, B.T. Kang, 
um, Ayanaba, myself, Tony Juo, uh, quite a few. And then later on, we learned uh, that was not the case. Uh, Ikrisat and uh, Siyat uh, were also considered to be natural resource based center. Yes. And uh, then, you, you know, in the 60s, uh, these were not CGAR, these were kind of funded by uh, donors like Ford and Rockefeller Foundation. So, for EGR came in mid 70s. When that came, uh, the mandate again became more commodity oriented. And I think part of the problem was we were looking for very rapid uh, impact. And unfortunately, a variety uh, impact can be very rapid, which is a good thing. But uh, that's the word, unfortunately, I remember. The soil impact may take decades or longer. So over a period of time, the role of soil scientists in the CGR system kind of vanished. In fact, my replacement did not happen very quickly. My experiment was not continued. Uh, some good scientists were hired, certainly, but not so. So then they came up the need for this, an IBSRAM, International Board for Soil Resource Management. Um, it was uh, set up in Bangkok, a center and funded primarily through French government. We had a couple of very good scientists, a French scientist, followed by uh, Eric Craswell from Australia. Uh, mm -hmm. They were dissolved and they joined with IMI. But you are very right. There is a need for a natural resource soil centric CGIAR center. And uh, whether it will happen, I think now is a good time because now CGIAR is under one umbrella. And uh, this is a discussion that must happen. Uh, ICARDA uh, has a very important component uh, on natural resource management. So does ICRISAT. Yes. So does DIAT uh, and others. Uh, perhaps they could somehow merge together their soil natural resource part. But the need is there. There's no question about it. Need is you know, uh, Ratan, you made me think back to the first time we met in the mid 80s in IITA in, in Ibadan, Nigeria where you were working on coming up with replacements for slash and burn agriculture, which would work with very low populations, but is non-sustainable and won't support higher levels of population growth as we've seen in that whole region. And uh, so you were, I remember the work on alley cropping and these principles are, these challenges are still there. They're inherent, I think, in all the things you were discussing earlier this morning. Is that right? Uh, one thing I must mention again, I probably may have said it, the green revolution in sub-Saharan Africa is still awaiting happen is because soil sustainable management of fragile natural resources has not been given the attention that it deserves. And uh, it's not too late. Eight years to 2030 uh, to end hunger and poverty, climate change action, we can still do it but we got to translate our words into action. So, um, so let's turn, uh, Raton, towards some of these uh, challenging policy questions here. Um, so uh, let's start with, here's one. How do challenges with land, this is from Austin Moore. How do challenges with land tenureship, lack of documentation and elite capture, you talked about land grabs, affect carbon payment schemes. This has been a challenge in operationalizing these approaches in poorer countries. I think this is a very uh, good point. Unfortunately, I am not very knowledgeable about social issues on land tenure, but you are absolutely right. Uh, land tenure rights, especially in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, are not pro-farmer. The farmer who is cultivating the land uh, may not own the land in most cases. And uh, especially the women farmers, which are 60 to 70 percent of those small holders. Uh, I came across as something which I will never forget. I was uh, visiting Simit, and uh, the colleague there uh, took me to see some farm. And on the way, I saw a farmer packing the crop residue, putting on a donkey cart to obviously take it away to market. And I stopped to picture and asked, 
why don't you leave this crop residue back? And the farmer through interpreter said, why should I? So I gave him all these common, you know, your crop next year will be very good. You'll save water, you'll save nutrient, you'll save uh, your productivity will be very good. And he answered back, this land will not be mine next year. And I don't need uh, as bad what is going to happen next year. I need the money tomorrow morning to buy shoes for my child. Here is the story of tenure. If a farmer does not own that land, he or she has no reason to invest long-term basis on that. So government, uh, local organization, they must make sure that the property rights are secure so that the long-term ownership belongs to the tiller of the land so that the, that tiller of the land is rewarded on a long-term basis. That's a very important issue. And I think the policymakers should really pay attention to it. Great, thank you, Ratan. And, and um, Seth Teta asks, uh, he, first he thanks you for your presentation. He says, it is obvious from your presentation that the need to restore soil health cannot be overemphasized. In your presentation, you recommended some technical solutions, regenerative agriculture, conservation agriculture, et cetera. Do you also see the need for sustainable, new sustainable policies to drive the change? And if I might, I just wanted to make one comment about the tenure. It seems to me, Ratan, if we're going to, uh, uh, I meant to say this first, sorry. If we're going to shift uh, towards a, a system of payments, this issue of tenure and ownership is going to become more critical than ever for all the reasons the question are flagged. So, but but let's let's go on now to this question of policy. What are your thoughts about how policy can play a role? Which I think Taylor um, also takes us from that to policy as well. Rob, uh, the important question really is how to translate known science into action. You know, whether it's a conservation agriculture, whether it's agroforestry, alley cropping, whatever you have, how do you try? There are four ways we could possibly think of. One is go back to the original uh, spiritual or religious beliefs, uh, whether people are believing in Islam or Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism. Uh, all scriptures really say protect, restore, manage Mother Earth properly. In fact, I have a table uh, showing what Judaism talks about it, what Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam. What they, so go back to our uh, spiritual leaders uh, and Pope Francis does a great job in his encyclic. He really emphasizes uh, the importance of protection of land resources. So that's one. The second part is uh, uh, giving uh, financial uh, importance. Uh, the third part is education. And I talk about education right from the field. The fourth part is policy. It's a very important part. The policymakers have to really translate into action. And I have been talking about the US. In the US, we have a Clean Air Act. We have Clean Water Act. I question whether you can have clean air and clean water without a healthy soil act. I really hope that the Farm Bill 2023 or 2024, Rob, will have a healthy soil act. I want to make sure it does not mean people who do not protect soil are going to be punished. No, it means those who protect soil will be rewarded. I think that's the way to go for it. We have on a global FAO had a uh, soil protection resolution going back to 70s and 80s, uh, but it has no implementation part. In 2008, uh, I was at that time, 2007, president of Soil Science Society America. I did submit a soil protection resolution. U.S. Senate passed it unanimously. It is a resolution 440. The 440 resolution was never translated by EPA into Soil Health Act. There's a need for it. And if U.S. adopts it, I'm sure Europe and rest of the world will follow suit. And this is something very close uh, to uh, the concept we are talking about. Fortunately, again, going back to the US Senate last year, 2020, I think, uh, we had a growing climate resolution act. It was approved by US Senate. 
but it again need to be translated into action. And that action translation means policy where farmers are rewarded. I think the farm bill coming up must really look into very closely and on a global scale that should uh, that should really follow out. So Soil Health Act and uh, payment to farmer through farm bill as an example of what can be done globally. Thank you. Thank you, Ratan. That's the I, I, I have to say the number of uh, questions that are coming in about this whole issue of soil carbon, financing it. Uh, here's another one from Bram Peters. I mean, well, I was going to say is I think we, we may need another session, a <laughs> deeper dive on this. But Bram Peters says, very insightful. What tensions do you see between land grabbing and soil carbon farming schemes now currently being proposed as part of climate action? Again, this question of money, ownership, uh, all, all, tenure, et cetera. Well, you know, uh, land grab is an issue. And I mentioned uh, when the per capita land required is 0.25 quarter of a hectare, and the country has only 0.05 or 0 0.06, uh, this is going to happen. So somewhere along the line, we have to make sure as a universal national, as well as international community, uh, hopefully United Nations can take more active part in it, is to make sure that the land within a country is used properly, justly, and with science-based uh, methodology, science-based, proven science technology, to bridge the yield gap, which exists very, very uh, hugely in the developing part of the world. I mentioned India, I mentioned example of Africa, same thing in Central America, same thing in the Caribbean. That is where the refugees come from, by the way. And that's what I call soil refugees, the numbers, uh, varies on who is estimating and uh, what is considered as a refugee, but it's uh, 75, 80 million people uh, which are so-called internally displaced. And land grab is a symptom of that uh, that uh, problem that we have to address. Somewhere it goes back to that the soil must be managed in such a way that it can support the people living on it. And my uh, favorite concept, which I've been talking about, is land and people are intricately interconnected. They, in fact, Rob, are mirror image of the land they live on. And you don't have to go far to see that interconnection. Drive through Midwest and drive through Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, the Caribbean. You will yeah. see that. So when people are miserable and suffering and poverty stricken, they pass their misery to the land and land reciprocates and that causes refugees. A so the solution, it's a spiral. The solution lies in restoring soil health on a long-term basis. I want to also pick up Ratan on a question from Carl Wall, who says, you know, how do we move from this systematic formulaic form of agriculture, improved seeds and fertilizer, voted under the Green Revolution to one that requires far more nuance according to specific soil and rainfall context. What are the implications for extension? And I guess that was the key thing I wanted to put in front of you for, uh, for from this question. This, how do you see uh, extension coming into uh, uh, this overall effort that's needed? Extension has a very, very important role to play. Uh, you, you know, uh, the problem that the technology has not been adopted uh, in those countries where there's a big yield gap because the support services of extension especially are very weak, uh, very weak indeed. So uh, organized uh, extension service, which means really helping farmer what are the modern technology and uh, Land grant system has worked very successfully in the US because here we had a combination of uh, research, teaching, and education. And some of the successful universities in South Asia adopted that system. I think that system is still not very well adopted in uh, elsewhere, such as in Sub Saharan Africa. Extension is under one government, 
education is under research is under other government and i think that uh, separate entities have created also a problem so one is the quality of extension uh, the magnitude strength ability of the extension service to provide the other the mechanism how they get education and research information to so integration uh, extension obviously is a very very critical part and it is even going to become uh, more important uh, even in the u.s now uh, and other elsewhere you know the moral act and you know Rob, more about it than i do at that time 1980 when the population of u.s came from rural to urban 50 50 right now it's 80 20. Is the land grant system now really effective in extension, not only for agriculture, but also for urban system and health systems and other? So extension role is dynamic. Yes. It, it has to keep it. So Ratan, I'm going to jump in because I know we're just we need to wrap up here, but I want Sean Baker, our chief nutritionist here at USAID, thanks you. And he says, it's a privilege to listen to your wisdom. For the Food System Summit, the UN Summit from last year, what for you were the biggest wins? What were the biggest missed opportunities? Well, the biggest win for me was that I was invited to be a member of the Science Committee and a member of Action Track 3, and I learned many things uh, by listening to others. So it was really a personally a great um, a pleasure to be part of that whole system. But I failed. I really failed. For example, I talk about nutrition sensitive agriculture. I talk about one health concept health of soil, plants, animal, people, ecosystem is interconnected. The one health concept that came out in the final was not the same. I talk about the word soil health restoration as the basic component of sustainable development goal achievement. The four letter word soil was not in the Secretary General report. So that is what I said, I failed. So, but failure is when you give up and we should never give up. Uh, COP26 was also a failure from that point of view. The word agriculture and soil were not in their final report. Should that happen in COP27? No, yeah. it should not. We are not talking about uh, an uh, isolation that varieties are important and irrigation is important for that. We are talking about soil health integrated system. How can you ignore it? So I think that was a disappointment, but disappointment does not mean that uh, so the cash I mentioned, uh, something that 110 countries are already, we are not giving up, we are continuing it. One day the top people will hear. So Ratan, I want to try to give you the last word here this morning. I just can't thank you enough for, and we have so many questions we couldn't get to. I apologize to those who, who wrote them. I tried to pick ones that I thought were representative. But Ratan, I guess I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, in your last comments, about agriculture and food, the environment and biodiversity and climate change. And, and, and what needs to happen that isn't happening now? I think giving uh, respect to agriculture profession, uh, the farmer comes number one on that, making sure they know that the public, the humanity respect them for doing great things such as giving them healthy, safe, and nutritious food, one part, healthy environment. Farmer are the greatest steward of the environment, uh, whether it's a soil degradation, whether it's a water quality, whether it's air quality, whether it's a biodiversity, they are really the steward of that. So uh, giving respectability to the profession uh, is very, very critical. And education to farmers, edu which is extension, education to the next generation, education of the policy makers, no farmer left behind. Uh, well, I like that. that. That's a slogan I think we want to leave. Uh, Ratan, I, I like that. Uh, the only thing I want to say is I think that we have to also find a way to, as you did, point out the, the huge benefits, if we get this right, to environment conservation, to 
environmental services, to biodiversity, to climate, uh, addressing climate change. So that's, I guess that's the key. Yes, that key is the agriculture has to be a solution to environmental issues. Okay. Not just the problem. We, we need to be on one team in my view, but <laughs> so. Well, thank you all for joining. We had still have a couple hundred people with us. What a, a fantastic session. I know this is going to be made available to everyone. And I think we're going to find ways to get more of your time on if you let us. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Bye, everyone.